If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I'm excited today. We have Major Hannes Nordman here with us. Honoris Kruxholder. Famous man in his own right, even though he might uh, say he's not. I can see he's smiling there in the background. But he's from a tank of armor warfare people, served in free to battalion as well. So you're most welcome here with us. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. But may I ask you, where do you come from? How did you end up in the South African Defense Force? And especially, how did you get into armor? Uh, Chris, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm humbled by your request. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm uh, just one of the, the normal 3-2 battalion and armor soldiers that happen to have been uh, probably at the right time at the right place, uh, because at least for the three years that I spent at 3-2 battalion, we had, we had some action, you know. And that was, of course, the reason why I was sent there, or why... Uh, our support group, as it was called at the time, was was created. But in any case, um, I grew up on a you know on a farm in the northern Transvaal bushveld, uh, as it was called those days. Limpopo today, Alice Russ went to high school there. Primary school was uh, called Marong. It doesn't exist anymore. We were all of about thirty-seven pupils in there. So to say, I was the head boy uh, of five uh, standard five. Boys, I mean, doesn't really, not one girl as well, doesn't really mean much. But in any case, so, and then I, I went to, my father became a politician, or he was a politician, but we moved to the constituency that he represented it in Pretoria. And my last two years, I finished there. And I wasn't 100% certain uh, as to exactly what I did. The military always appealed to me. Um, but uh, so I was called up uh, to one SSB. Uh, in the trick, and so I um, I clocked in there at, at, at one SSB with like hundreds of other people, um, and we did a quick selection there. I remember the day at the parade ground, you know, all in one queue, and I think it was the corporal and lieutenant whoever asked you a couple of questions, and you go there and you go there. So I ended up in the in the bunch of guys who went to armored school, school of armor. And uh, then was selected CEO and uh, we finished our first year. And then I was posted to two SSB in Zerist where I did my second year as a troop command. And then uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Jakob and us, he all of a sudden decided to join permanent force and uh, was, he was, uh, going on to formative branch and I thought, gee, but I mean that this this is a very lucky guy. I actually think that is what I would I would have liked as well. So I mentioned that to my father and uh, now and then it you know pol political connections helps a bit. So some of that Monday when I got back to Zerist I, I had a call up to report to Heidelberg at the formative branch and I, I joined as well. And uh, yeah so we did formative branch and then of course they was uh, selected to go to the military academy where I did three year uh, BAB MOL course, um, political science, because I have a great interest in politics, just like my father did. Uh, and I was kind of planning to go into politics one day, but of course the dispensation changed to such an extent that um, it didn't really appeal that much to me later on. And also, in my time, you weren't allowed to get involved in physical politics while use, uh, wearing a uniform. And um, so, and unless you kind of worked yourself in there or had the right connections, it's, you know, when, when the dispensation changed in 94, it wasn't people uh, elected uh, for a constituency, it was on a representative basis. So, your name was on a list and to get on that list, of course, you know, you had to have been known, active, etc., which wasn't the case in my my event. So I carried on with a career in the military. Um, after the academy, we went back to, to SSB and uh, School of Armour, where I was a tank squadron commander. And I was um, then also selected while I was there for the uh, 
evaluation of the new armored vehicle, the armored car in, in the, the army, which I is really one of the uh, uh, events that stood, stands out for me in my career. Uh, six months we spent evaluating three concept models of which the record was one. The other two were German models. Um, and we, we did an evaluation, probably one of the most thorough evaluations that, that, that you will find. Uh, the then uh, general, or at the time, Colonel uh, Johanna Ruiz was in charge of that. And he was with us all the time, starting at the NEL, you know, the Gerotech test uh, facility. And then we went to Luatla. And then from there, we actually physically drove it to, uh, to the uh, border area in, 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 uh, uh, with where 61 MEC was uh, stationed, Oshivella. And we did bush. Uh, evaluation there. So that was really a very thorough one. And of course, the record came out on tops and was selected and eventually went into production. And that's what we have it. So that was um, quite exciting. And then I was also selected when the new ZT3 missile uh, was developed as, a, as a, you know, as someone to, to test it and be trained on it. We did the training at Kentron and um, obviously fired some missiles. In those days, the, the missiles were very, very expensive. Um, I recall the price of 500,000 Rand per, per missile. And <clears throat> okay, so we did that training and that was in development. And then, you know, it was 1983, around about. Uh, they also had municipal police training that they decided that if uh, the military should uh, uh, execute. So they had a few batches of 1,500 uh, guys at a time that they trained as municipal police. And I was, I was put in charge by the uh, officer commanding of, of, of this training with a bunch of uh, instructors and sergeant majors from all over the army. I mean, I, I recall my sergeant major was, uh, uh, I can't remember his name now, but one of those outstanding infantry sergeant majors. Uh, it was just a privilege to work with him and the others. That's also where I seriously considered changing my, my signature because at the end of each course, I had to sign a certificate for each of the 1,500 candidates that passed out and, and uh, I've got quite a, a complicated signature. So, I mean, that was very tiring, but in any case. So while I was um, busy with the second group uh, in charge there, we did the training at, I think it was 21 bat battalion lanes um, at the time. Um, I got a call to go and see uh, Director Armour. Uh, I was a major at the time and uh, I reported at Army headquarters and he said to me, he's got something serious to discuss with me. Um, they are creating this support group. They are expecting trouble in Angola and they're creating a support group to be attached to 3T Battalion, which is the, comp the, the, the unit that is best known with the, with the Southern Angolan environment and so on. And uh, he wants me to be the uh, armored uh, commander and that would consist out of one squadron uh, they, they, they called it an anti-tank squadron um, which is more a, an infantry term than an armored one but I mean the uh, reason for that was that uh, I would have two armored car uh, troops and one missile troop and that missile troop would be the newly still secret uh, developed uh, ZT-3 missile. Okay, I was obviously trained on it as well. So um, I said to him, well, it's fine. I mean, I was unmarried at the time, so I was probably a good uh, candidate. So we, we prepared uh, at Kentron, we did the, the course again and finished everything. The, the missile wasn't ready at the time. And like I said, it was still top secret. And he also said to me, the director of uh, at the time, Colonel Anton Fouré, who tragically died in a car accident uh, of, uh, later on. He said to me, look, he used to call you Persoon. 
is een persoon. These, these, these uh, missiles are top secret. Uh, they have been developed in conjunction with uh, countries that most people will probably know at the time, mainly Israel. Uh, but um, if they capture one of these vehicles, then make sure you are with that vehicle because you shouldn't rather not come back. So I got that message very loud and clear. So we always had to to keep the the missiles covered, which you know was, was just pulling a, a canvas over the three launching tubes, basically. But anybody could see this is a this is not a a Rattle 90 and it's not a Rattle 60 and uh, there's something on there. So people would stop and ask, stop you and ask, but I mean. Um, it, it didn't draw too much attention because we physically drove the vehicles to three people. So at the beginning of 1986, 1986 um, the support group um, under the command of um, then uh, Commandant Robbie Hartsley. Uh, so I was the anti-tank squadron commander. Perry Franken was the artillery commander, the artillery consisting of a battery of um, uh, 121 uh, rocket launchers, and then a battery, an anti-aircraft battery under the command of Louis Skippers. Uh, and they had the rather new, uh, what, what was it, uh, 20, 20 millimeter uh, Eisterfarke, as they used to call them at the time. <clears throat> so um, we, we arrived there and uh, we started with training in 86. Uh, got to know and 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 the the whole three two battalion uh, situation. Everybody, of course, in the army knew three two battalion as as one of the elite fighting units in the army. And I mean, the chief of the SADF uh, at the time, and even uh, General Feldmeis, um didn't make any secret of of how they felt about that. Uh, the fact that his son was also in 3 to battalion didn't really have anything to do with that, I guess, but uh, he, was, he was right in any game. So we did training in 86. We, you know, this whole situation was in anticipation of an advance by, by a built up of, of forces consisting of mainly, obviously, FAPLA. And um, then they had massive support from the Cubans, of course. Um, and uh, also advisors from uh, East Germany and, and Russia, mainly mainly on the artillery. And uh, on that side, uh, the East Germans were quite active. Uh, aircraft as well were flown mainly by the Cubans. But anyway, so we, we did our training in 86. Uh, nothing really happened. We went in uh, with a small operation. Once I went with uh, Colonel Eddie Filyun at the time in his buffle uh, because we did just a hit on uh, on Puerto uh, Vale where they had, you know, a, a kind of a assembly of of of, of forces, and uh, we decided to okay, let's just kind of give them a, a wake up call there, and I'll never forget. Um, we were positioned on a copy to the east of Quito Carnival. Obviously, you know, the forward observation uh, officers always pick the outstanding highest point, which also is normally the one that is uh, on the target list of the enemy. But in any case, um, so we, we were sitting there and directed the G5 fire onto Quito Carnival. Uh, and then they struck uh, an ammunition dump. And I've seen many fireworks in my life. Uh, every year I watch the fireworks here in the harbor from Blowwork Strand. Um, fascinating, but I've never seen fireworks like that night when they hit that, that ammo dump with a, with a G5. So it just cooked off right through the night. It carried on like the next day, but um, that certainly destroyed whatever they had there. That was a, an excellent hit. Any case, so uh, yeah, of course, the next morning we knew the mix would come, so they did. And I also very uh, love aircraft, 
uh, you know, when everybody else dives into a foxhole, I normally run out to, to watch the aircraft. And I can still remember the MiG-23 is coming, you know, I was standing behind a tree trunk, the others were in their foxholes, but I was watching this MiG as it came in and they, they correctly identified this copy again. And you know, its wings were doing this as the as the pilot was uh, aiming, and then he let go of his rockets, which started, you know, hitting the ground about 30 meters from me further on. Uh, that was really a very nice sight. Uh, any case, so so that happened, but we all got away there unscathed, and so we returned. So in eighty six, uh, nothing seriously happened, and then eighty seven, we we moved. We realized that the bolt up quite seriously now and uh, we moved in initially I also uh, just moved with with some of the three two guys uh, and the ag -AC guys the anti-aircraft ones and the artillery we didn't take any armor with just to to see and normally you know it, it, it wasn't a big problem to stop these guys um, and we thought with our superior artillery power uh, it would be easy to kind of convince them to stop this march like I, I'll, I'll never forget uh they gathered and we it was it was quite obvious that they were preparing to start with a big push uh, towards the south and of course their aim being to um capture mavinga where jonas savimbi was uh his headquarters was at the time and uh, simply get rid of him because he was uh he was really a a, a nuisance to them um and you know we we were there to stop that from happening so that night we obviously with our reconnaissance forces and and, and the feedback we directed a massive artillery barrage on to these uh enemy brigades that were about to start their their move southward and we thought okay fine this this would have taught them a proper lesson and lo and behold, the next morning, the brigades just carried on with their offensive. They just started moving south. And then we realized that these dudes are here. They are serious. This is not going to be just one quick barrage and everything will be over. And that's also when we realized, uh, because they've got tanks, we didn't even have tanks there. I've got uh, two, two troops of, of Rattle 90s and our Actually, you should not be on the same map with a 90 millimeter gun as a T-55 or a T-62. Uh, I mean, and, uh, in any case, all the doctrine uh, determines that you should do those kinds of tank battles over an open fire uh, arc, you know, uh, open open uh, fields is, is where you would normally do a, a typical armored a tank battle. Here we were sitting in the bushes. And uh, they flew me out that night, and it was clear we, we need armor, seriously. So I had to collect my, my squadron and the ZT-3 missiles on which we've done tests. Um, and they went 100%, well, I wouldn't say they were, they were probably about 80, 75, 80% uh, operation already, uh, because the missile had a had an inclination to drop every time it was fired. It was guided by a laser uh, detector. So, you know, it struggled to pick up the, the, the guidance in the beginning. So we lost quite a, a, a couple of missiles and then one would, would uh, pick up and, and then you could guide it with an active range of um, 4,000 meters. Um, so, we, we, we moved the vehicles in, we moved in with my old squadron, we got there, but still these guys were, were moving southward. So they also then activated the tank squadron from School of Armor, uh, where Farad Lowe, that I've just mentioned to you before, uh, was the, the squadron. No, 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 that was Andre Retief, sorry. Andre Retief was the squadron commander there. Uh, also, uh, he was the previous director of armor, uh, Brigadier General, also someone to, uh, who would be able to give a very interesting recount of things that happened there with the tank squadron that moved from physically from Bloemfontein right up there to the battle area. So we were moving 
uh, around. We know we knew the people, the you know the enemy. The, I can't remember all the brigades now. Fifty three brigade, fifty nine, uh, twenty one, I think. Uh, so, you know, we had to navigate um, our way through thick bushes mainly at night, um, and uh, we were on this side of the. Uh, the, the Guanabala River, I think it was, or the Quitu, not, not the Quitu, was the big one, or one of the east-west running uh, rivers. And we knew that the one of the brigades were going to cross. In fact, we actually positioned ourselves just across the river from where they were positioned. And we were lying there for a good, a good few, few weeks waiting for something to happen you know they that now and then they would fire on us and we would fire on them there was a, a water hole there on the other side of the this open shauna uh, with a river on the other side that shauna was probably the better part of about two and a half kilometers at least uh, to three three thousand meters now you don't want to waste your ammunition but when too many of them gathered at the water hole then we would um, we would uh, you know request some uh, strike from the from the artillery guys and then you know they they would keep away from there and when they had ammunition they also had quite a good idea of where we were they would shoot us with their bm21s but uh, never really hit us so it was fine i i even considered at one stage to to send a request to the commander of that brigade for a, for a soccer match in the Shona. But I don't think that would have gone down too well because our reconnaissance guys, all of them, you know, being uh, from Angola, speaking the language, looking like they, 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 they black Portuguese uh, soldiers, they would go into the base at night dressed in their clothing, walk around, talk to the guys, get all the information and then leave a coke tin on the on the roof of the of the of their regiment commander just to make the point that the South Africans were there during the course of the night. And that you know that caused a flurry of activity the next morning as they were trying to find out what happened. But we knew exactly what was going on. We we knew each other and we checked each other out. Um, so and I also knew, you know, when their ammunition was like uh, depleted, we could fire and they wouldn't fire back. And then we gave them hell. But then you would also hear at night when their replenishes, replenishments arrived. So the next morning, you know, we had to lie low, no movement, because then they would shoot the hell out of you on this side again. In any event, so eventually a crossing had to, had to happen. Uh, it was just a matter of where were they going to to cross this river um, to the to the east or further towards the Quitu. You know, we we drove down further to the east, and we actually thought that it would be easier further east. And um, you know, from where we were lying for a long time, and this this oh, I'm talking now is the is the combat team that I was commanding. I was combat team Alpha of or combating one of uh, battle group bravo uh, robbie Hartley being the battle group uh, commander so my combat team we moved down to the east of the uh, uh, I, th I think it was the shambinga river where we thought it would be easier to cross it. and while we were there uh, one day we got we got uh, note that they has been or they are attempting to put a, a bridge across the river and they are going to attempt to, to cross. And uh, that afternoon we actually saw the bridge and we fired a few missiles. Uh, I think we destroyed the bridge laying, the, you know, the, the, the bridge vehicle. Um, and also uh, I know I can very well remember eating one person was sitting he was kneeling and we fired the missile at this thing and he obviously wasn't aware of the fact that there was a missile approaching so he got up from from where he was kneeling and this missile hit him straight on uh, that that i saw through the binocular but in any case so we destroyed this bridge uh vehicle of theirs it was lying there in the river and that crossing didn't take place so we moved back 
and then one, a couple of days later, uh, one night, I think it was about nine, ten o'clock, uh, the battle group commander Robbie Arslick contacted me, contacted me, and he said, uh, "Prepare, there has been a crossing, and that crossing hasn't been there where we expected." Uh, it is reported that some of the forces have already crossed the river and they are on, uh, on the uh, southern side of the, of the river and we had to clean them up. So I gave orders, I can remember that night, I, I gave orders at 12 o'clock, had the map against my rattle in a, with a torchlight, uh, just uh, indicating positions and so on. And we started advancing, obviously in, in complete darkness. It, it was also dark moon because even our uh, passive night view equipment wasn't very clear. It was uh, it was very very difficult because we had to advance um, with with the infantry in front of us and between the vehicles as well. You could hardly see the vehicle, let alone the people. But in any case, slowly slowly we we, we advanced because we didn't know exactly where, we couldn't get a position. It was just, we were just told that they are on the side of the river. We could be anywhere within the next, next 10 kilometers or what. So we had to be ready. So we advanced in, in open formation, carried on, carried on. By almost first light that morning, we still haven't made contact. So uh, just as it started uh, as, uh, to, to uh, you know, at dawn, I stopped the whole uh, operation. I I ran down to the to the riverside, you know, looked over the Shona, and I, I saw the the bends in the river, and I decided, okay, I'm going to move a, a little bit further to the west uh, for about 500 meters, and that is where we will then, you know, uh, take in positions and camouflage for the rest of the day because we can't move during the day. At that stage, they they had uh, superiority on the on the uh, uh, air force. We we had a situation prior to that uh, because we, we we had we you know we listened in to their radios. Uh, we had uh, very very sophisticated uh, in you know uh, equipment that could track all their radio activity, and we had one of these IO vehicles. Uh, monitoring the, the uh, radio communication in Russian and in Spanish for the Cubans and uh, also in, in Portuguese. And I can remember just prior to this now one day, because before that, every time they scrambled uh, a MiG, we would scramble the Mirages from Rundu, and then those guys would turn around and, and head back home very rapidly. And then this one day, uh, there was uh, there was this radio communication. The mix took off again. I think they took off from Menon, and they were heading our way to the east. And once again, they scrambled the mirages from Rundu, and they were heading this way. And I can remember there was uh, the 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 flight commander, the squadron commander of the Cuban uh, uh, flight squadron. That, uh, he had a very deep voice. His, his name, his uh, call sign was Quattro, I think. And there was obviously a very junior pilot uh, amongst the, the, the aircraft flying. And this guy was sounding very nervous. And, and this Quattro said uh, in his deep voice, he said, don't worry, don't worry. Today we have our secret weapon. Today they're going to get a surprise. And you know that was that was now a few weeks back uh, while we were still lying there across the uh, the brigade on the other side. So that message was relayed, and we all thought, you know, the the the, uh, the the thought was at the time from brigade headquarters that it could be uh, a gas attack. So we all had to scramble and get our gas mask, which I don't think would have been worth a lot, but in any case, so. We, we got that ready. We pulled back even a bit uh, from our uh, existing positions. And then the Mirages came in and what it turned out to be was their first um, frontal attack capability with the missile. So they fired on the Mirages while they were still way away. In the past, you know, it, that, that ended up with the Mirages chasing them. But they now had this 
uh, capability of firing a missile to attack our fighter aircraft while they were still approaching, which they didn't uh, uh, exactly expect that, uh, you know, the Air Force guys can, can talk about that in a lot more detail. But I think one of our mirages was hit with a shrapnel of this missile causing hydraulic failures and so on. They just realized all of a sudden, our guys, that um, yeah, this is this is something totally new, uh, and they hit tree level and headed back uh, to the base. I think it was Arthur Walker, who was it? The pilot who then tried to land. Uh, he didn't have hydraulics or brakes or anything, and the net that was supposed to catch the aircraft also didn't work at that day, and he overshot uh, the runway and. Uh, you probably know he eventually um, ejected and he, he was too low and he, he fell back and, and became paralyzed, I believe. So uh, that, that incident happened way before. So after that, we didn't have air superiority anymore. So any movement during daytime was kind of totally uh, out of bounds. So um, that... that um, that morning, I had to stop the advance to dig in and camouflage for the day. Um, you know, as I was doing my my evaluation of the terrain, like I said, I I, I wanted to move another 500 meters further to the west, and then we would uh, start our preparations. You know, camouflaging and so on, because I knew the the aircraft would probably come and. Before we moved another 200 meters, we we moved right into this this uh, a couple of hundred infantrymen that moved across the river and dug themselves in. We we drove straight into them in their trenches, uh, you know, and it was it was bushy as I said, so they couldn't see us from far away. We couldn't see them. We physically bumped into them. Several of the rattles were, were shot with RPGs, none of which detonated because of the fact that the distance was too short. All of them had hits, and, uh, but it never, never exploded, never penetrated or what. So we were very uh, lucky there. And of course, um, uh, the guys from, uh, guys from, from Obama land, the one at that 21 battalion, I'm not sure, um, they had a feast, uh, you know, shooting at, at all these guys, uh, they because all of a sudden when they saw the, the rattles, which they didn't expect, um, they ran away. They, they, they headed back over the Shona and they decided the best place for them would be to, to get back where they come from. Uh, obviously not, not thinking of the, the 2,500 meters of open terrain. So the rattles and even the caspers that uh, were with us just stopped on the on the side of the the shona and opened fire. You know they they just kept their their machine guns in one position and these guys ran into the the fire. They fell. I think about three hundred of them were killed that day. Um, but when this happened, obviously the brigade on the other side realized that uh, uh, there's, there's serious trouble on this side. So that's when they sent their tanks uh, across. Now in the past, that worked very well with UNITA because the moment the tanks appeared, uh, they were no more the UNITA. So whatever they wanted, they got. And uh, I don't blame them. I mean, not easy for an infantryman to fight against the tank. It's very intimidating. So they sent their tanks across. And that is why, you know, I remember I was sitting on my Radl command vehicle and the artillery, our artillery uh, uh, observation officer, I think his name was Chris Brad Kumar, was sitting here next to me and he just said, my fuck, me, you are tanks. And I, and, I, and I looked and I saw tanks coming across the Shona towards us. They were not heading 100% in our direction, they, they miscalculated uh, our position a bit. They were heading slightly skew, I would say uh, about 10 o'clock from, from, from where we were, or rather seven o'clock there, there uh, seven o'clock from their side. And uh, 
we we just had this clash now unfortunately i had i had to leave two of them behind because i didn't take the full force when i started the uh, the advance uh, westward we left some there because we still thought maybe they would try some crossing there but my ZT3s weren't all operational. Only two of them were operational. So I left one operational and non -oper and one non-operational one behind, and I had one operational and one non-operational with me. And uh, the one that was working was that of the troop commander. Um, so immediately when we saw the tanks approaching, uh, I called him on the radio, but he was wounded during this clash. Uh, he, he, he took some shrapnel in his eye. So he was at the moment, at that very moment, he was with the ambulance, with the doctor, you know, being attended to. And he didn't answer his radio. He didn't answer his radio. And of course, I was now calling him because that was obviously the right thing, you know, to, to, to stop these guys with. I mean, yes, yes, our first opportunity to engage with the ZT-3 uh, missiles. And... Uh, I didn't know that he was with the ambulances, so I keep calling, calling, I kept calling. He didn't answer, but I knew more or less where the where the rattle was was uh, positioned. So I just jumped off um, of my command vehicle and I ran uh, to the vehicle. I said, "Where the hell is uh, um, Ian Roberts? I think was his name, Robertson." Um, no, and they told me, and I jumped into the command seat uh, because I mean, I'm obviously a fully qualified and a trained uh, missile operator as well. So um, the rest of the crew were all there. So I had my gunner, and the loader, and the driver, and I said, "Okay, let's move back to get some height." I I was hoping to be able to clear the the the, the tree level in front of me, but I couldn't. I reversed back, reversed back. And I realized, no, I'm, I'm not getting enough height. Uh, there's still trees in front of me. I need an open arc of fire. And in the meantime, the tanks are, are coming, you know. So I said, right, there's only one thing now, head back towards the Shona. We have to get to the edge of the Shona uh, to get this um, open uh, field. And uh, we stopped there. And, and we fired. We started firing at these approaching tanks. And now, like I said, uh, we, we had issues with a uh, with pickup of the missile with a laser uh, uh, detector and I think the first one or two, even three missiles, you know, after launch just plunged to the ground, uh, went uh, picked up. And then one actually uh, got a pickup and, and we directed that missile, the, the gunner, but he hit the tree. Uh, I, I still pick, uh, took pictures afterwards of this little tree where the thin marks of the missile uh, were clearly visible. In any case, I think about the fourth or fifth missile, we hit the first tank. Um, and, and, and then, you know, it, it stopped the tank in its tracks. My gunner went about ballistic i mean my shouting i think there's still a, a, a sound clip of this uh, incident because you know whenever you fire a missile it records from that moment you know for it takes 16 seconds for the missile to fly over four kilometers so we've got enough time uh, and during that it records so i had to give him a quite a whack just to calm him down you know get i mean flip an l there are other tanks approaching there were more tanks there but others turned around uh, earlier but two more were still coming so we hit the the next tank as well when we see when we hit the second tank the third one decided no 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 this is this is enough evidence that he's not going to make it so he made a u-turn and uh you know, we fired more than one missile at, at the second tank as well, eventually hitting, hitting it. It took, immediately stopped it in its tracks. And then, of course, you know, with the penetration of the missile, it detonated the, uh, the ammunition inside. So that ammo cooked off, blowing the complete turret off the tank, really. Any anyway, case, so the third one, and that is the shot that I will never forget. It was the most spectacular one that I've seen. We hit that one obviously on its way back and uh, now by now the, you know the gunner was kind of settled um, 
calmed down and I was calmed down and and it was a pinpoint accurate shot on the turret and I remember pieces of metal flying about 50 meters into the into the air and obviously also it stopped right there in its tracks and uh, I remember the, the the driver driver is normally the one that that got out first uh, the, the crew members were probably all dead after the first hit but in both cases or at least two of the cases the gunners after the drivers managed to get out of the tank and started running and they just picked them up with the, with the machine guns then so yeah that was that was the the end of our that was our first and last use of the z 3 missile very very effective that of course was was uh, huge news for for the uh, director of alma I sent my sit rep and uh, that was then sent back to army headquarters and uh, apparently the Colonel Pori, director of the contact at the MD of Kentron at the time and uh, announced to him, listen, your product works. We've just taken out the first tanks. Congratulations. And they were so over the moon. Apparently they closed Kentron for the rest of that day. And, you know, it was just uh, festivity there. But um, yeah, so we knew we were going to be attacked by the aircraft. So that followed within about uh, less than an hour. They came, but still, for some reason, they, they had our position wrong, uh, further to the west, the same way the tanks were heading. And um, yeah, I, I might just mention, you know, the 90s also opened fire on those approaching tanks. And I can remember the flashes, the flashes on the tank as it hit them, but um, you know that was way out of their range. They they didn't make any impression. Um, just bouncing off the the turrets. Another another proof that you know you cannot take on a tank with a ninety unless it's very close. So, um, like I say, within about forty five minutes, the mix came, and they bombed the area. But all their bombs landed like about. 250, 500 meters to the west of our positions. We were obviously prepared. We were dug in and we in our foxholes and so on, but we we weren't deep. So yeah, that was that was about the 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 best. Well, yeah, one of the the the, the nicest scores that we had during the whole campaign. Um, after that day, never ever that any of those brigades again advance over an open field over an open area open terrain they would take a 10 kilometer detour but avoid absolutely every shona every open piece of field uh, because now they realized they were something that 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 was uh, more dangerous than they than they anticipated uh, i was involved in in total in about um i can't remember them now but i, I remember Counting at the time, it was uh, 10, 10 close tank battles. You know, um, that, that where we did fight the tanks with the 90 millimeter uh, guns that were mounted on our rattles. The, 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 you know, the mobility of the rattle was, was okay. Was okay. Not nearly as good as that of the Roycott, which was now going to enter production and having evaluated the, the Roycott. I so wish that I had a squadron of Roy Cutter there because I would have, I would have, you know, it would have allowed us to go behind them uh, with that superior firepower and mobility with the eight wheels. But uh, all our fights that we had with the tanks were probably at the maximum of 100 meters range, which suited the gun. Uh, of the of the 90s uh, that's the only way you can actually fight a tank is at that close range and we had an advantage because the rattles were much higher uh, with a 90 turret mounted on top of it so we had better vision they also had a habit of of closing the hatches and i mean i just couldn't i just couldn't command my my force while sitting in a hatch so i always uh, stood out my hatch and I could, you know, uh, do proper observation and, and direct uh, fire. Okay, that also had its um, its 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 effects because that that landed me in, in 
in two in one more, uh, having been wounded, shot through the neck and, and my hand. But uh, in general, uh, we had much better control and we could direct the vehicles. So they, their visibility was just not as, as well as, as ours, you know, the visibility and, and the, the tactical uh, maneuvers or maneuverability due to this lack of, of, of vision that they would have inside a lowish tank with closed edges. Uh, of course, yeah, that, that's, um, that's the situation, um, you know, up to our application of the ZT-3 missile. After that, we never used them again. At my last, um, there was one incident after that um, that I can talk about. The last uh, clash that we had at uh, Kaluhek, we never used them because um, the range was, there was no open field of fire. Um, that was the very last fight of the operation as well because the peace talks started just after that incident. And of course, the, the bombing of the of the uh, uh, dam wall at, at Kaluik. Um, I don't know if you want me to carry on talking about those those incidents as well. One is I've been sitting here making notes, and I wish to thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> this is fantastic to hear from you. I have a few questions about the Z three Z T three. We have a lot of foreigners looking at, uh, at the show, and thank you. You're welcome here with us. One of the reasons we speak English, so we can read you as well. But the Z3, I've heard rumors that it was based upon the, um, either the Milan or the uh, TOW, the, the US one. Uh, would you like to comment, is that true or not, or is it just a rumor? No, it wasn't based on, on, on one of them. Um, that one was using laser technology to guide the, the missile. It was not wire guided at all. It was a, a, a new development by Kentron, like I said, in conjunction with the Israelis. Um, so no, no uh, relation there. Okay, thanks. I'm glad you dispelled that rumor. That's one of the things we do here at Legacy. You know, we hear these rumors and, we, and sometimes we dispel them. Thank you. What war did this thing have, if you can remember? Was it heat? It was, uh, it was heat, obviously, because it was meant uh, for uh, penetrating armor. It was 127 millimeters. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think, I, I don't know the exact uh, amount of, of, of uh, uh, explosions that was in the head, but, you know, the penetration capability of it was uh, more than 500 meters of, of armored steel uh, at the time. And I, I haven't sent, you know, uh, pictures, but I've taken quite a, quite a number of pictures. Later that day, when we, you know, after the events that afternoon, now the tanks were still standing there on the horizon, not, you know, in the shore now burning for most of the day. And then later that afternoon, obviously, when it, things subsided a bit, uh, and you know, we are almost um, are a bit curious, we wanted to go and, 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 and check out our kills there. So I took, I took uh, one of the company commanders, Mac McCollum, who was unfortunately killed three days later, and uh, the UNITA commander with me. So we, 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 we were now going to inspect these, uh, these tanks that we shot out and uh, recover what was, you know, get some bait there. And um, I expected that we would be fired upon. So we lined up the 90 millimeters because the range was too far. You know, they had to, to raise their, their guns high to reach the other side of the, the shore now, should something happen. So I, I kind of arranged that. And then we walked across the shore now got to the first tank, you know, and we took pictures. Um, and you will see one of the, the pictures that I took of the tank, you know, the big hole, uh, clearly, where that missile entered right through the turret. Um, it's quite big, much bigger than obviously, uh, you know, the uh, FSDS around the uh, armor piercing tip of a, of a 
of a tank projector. But uh, in any case, so we checked out the first tank, picked up some of the of the equipment that was uh, blown out of the turret. We then went to the second one and got some nice stuff there as well. Uh, brand new, brand new equipment. Even the tanks were, they were T-55s, brand new. And then when we started moving to the last one, the third one, deeper in, they started hitting us with mortar. So uh, I'm not an infantryman. I haven't done that much leopard crawl except for our our typical opox that we have during basics mainly, or when we were under training. But I've never done leopard crawl in such a short time in you know in such a at such a high speed. Uh, we leopard crawl that like 500 meters out of the terrain because the mortars were now falling all over us. Uh, some of them. As, as close as I think the closest one to me was about 30 meters, but we were low down. Uh, and we, we, we just leopard crawled out of that with our bait. I had a, a small shovel that I picked up there and then some, some nice other pieces of equipment. Yeah, that was uh, also something that I, that I won't forget. That's fascinating. I must ask you about the story. It might not be at YouTube, but I've heard somewhere that the South Africans got hold of an enemy tank. I believe it was a T-34, and they melted it down to make me metals out of it. In the same way that the British did at Balaclava with a charge of a light brigade, they took a cannon barrels of a Russian guns and made the Victoria Cross out of it. Is that true? Um, I, I, you know, I wasn't part of anything of it, but uh, I, I believe that is true. Uh, because I've uh, been informed accordingly by, you know, by colleagues and, and very reliable sources. So, yeah, I do believe it's true. Well, that's fantastic. We're getting somebody anyway who's going to speak to us about decorations and medals. And yeah, and he expert. will know. He will tell us that, but I thought I would ask you. Now I need to go back to the Rattle 90 gun. I understand it's a low pressure 90 millimeters, and that's why you had problems shooting out enemy armor. It's not really designed to do that. Uh, am I correct if I say that? No, oh, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> the, you know, the, the maximum range of a, of a 90 is, is uh, I think it's 1,200 meters. And when you fire an HE round, uh, which is, is very effective, you know, that's a very effective uh, projectile. Every time when, when I fired a 90 HE round because your barrel is obviously elevated much higher because the velocity is much lower than that of an HE uh, of, a, of a heat round. Um, I could actually follow that missile with my eye. I can always follow the the the, the physical missile that was well, I say missile projector or other um, when you fire an HE. Because I think the velocity was probably something like 750. I'll, I'll speak under correction. I can't remember. The heat was a lot faster, uh, and obviously the the elevation of your barrel would be lower as well. And the heat was was effective. Um, I I can't remember the effective penetration, armored penetration of the heat round, but of course it was not nearly that of a tank or that of the ZT-3 missile, which was even the biggest at the time. Uh, but it was still efficient if you were close enough to, to do penetrate a tank at the right places. Uh, obviously, the, least, the last place you want to try and shoot at a tank is right from the front, you know, um, because normally it's sloped there, and that's where the thickest armor uh, also is. So you would waste your time, especially with the 90. Not even some tank projectors will, 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 will penetrate there uh, if you don't hit it at the right angle. But um, at close enough range and um, at the right place on the sides and just below the, the turret, um, you would be able to penetrate the tank. So what we, what we did was, uh, in all cases, we fired at least about between five and seven rounds at the tank. Uh, until you could see, you know, that 
the, 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 the tank is starting to burn and that there is internal explosion. In other words, you've set off the, uh, the ammo in the tank, which, which uh, caused most of the damage in any case. But uh, as long as you could penetrate it uh, and get to the ammo on the inside, you would not only kill the, uh, the crew, uh, basically stopping it from, from fighting back, but uh, you know you set off that uh, ammunition on the inside, and that's basically what you wanted. And like I said, we had incidences uh, where, where, in the one case, the the the, the guys with the rattle came out of the bush, and there was this T T fifty five or T fifty four, I don't know what it was, and they were kind of chasing each other in around around, so close that. You know, the, the rattle was, I don't think it was 55, it must have been a slower one because this this tank gunner also tried to swing his gun to the rattle, but uh, be as it may, the, the rattle was the fastest. And But I'm talking literally 15 meters apart and he got in the first shot, which basically stopped the tank. And then, you know, it's just a matter of repeat, repeat, repeat uh, as, as quick as possible. and and. All the other, in all the other fights that we were, that's what we did. Yeah, you know, we hit them at like anything between 50 and 100 meters between the bushes. You could see them, observe and and, and identify them before they could see us. And uh, we were just lucky that they didn't fire at us first. I was one of the um, one of the only groups I think that was physically attacked one night at the copy. Uh, it wasn't in the night. We occupied the copy during night hour and the next day there was just too much activity, enemy activity around. You know, you'd see troops and they were going down to the river. I thought, yeah, but uh, this, this is, doesn't sound right. Uh, our in information was, uh, was that, you know, their brigades were much further away. Otherwise, we wouldn't you know, I've, I've gone to, to occupy this this high ground that, that I was sent to do. So uh, that afternoon, we heard this massive thundering sound and we realized, oh, okay, only one thing that makes sound like that, and that's not, not a tank, not one tank, lots of tanks. So we were actually chased off that copy that day by the enemy, one of the enemy brigades, and it turned out that they had their positions about one and a half kilometers from that from that high copy that we occupied that night. And that explained all the enemy activity going to the water or walking around, you know, and 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 so on. So I realized, you know, I remember, I don't know if Luis Kepler will still re recall this, but he was he was he was every afternoon at a certain time he would request our um, needs in terms of replenishment you know how much rounds you need how much water food whatever diesel uh so this day just as these guys started with their their attack on on us louis came onto the radio and he was now asking for my report i said look I'm, just get off the radio now I, mean, I can't talk to you now i've got much much more important things to to take uh, care of that day also, you know, what happened when the tanks came through the bushes, um, we hit them, we put, we had HE rounds uh, most of the time in there. Only when, once you know you are going to engage or you've got a target, would we uh, load with a, with a heat. So as the tanks came through, um, the first three of them, we hit them with, with HE and, and physically right, you know, at the, um, at the, on the sides. So physically taking out that capability, the, the periscopes were, because they closed most of their hatches. So the periscopes were damaged, the sight was, was damaged, so they couldn't direct accurate on. They, they, they fired a few shots, but that gave us the opportunity to actually get the hell out of there and um, without a single casualty. So they then reoccupied this place or not. They didn't occupy it before the time, but they, they basically chased us off there. And that day I had to run away from tanks like at, uh, at quite a speed. My other, the other combat team that was there with me was, was way ahead of me. But uh, in any case, we managed to get everybody out of there and, uh, and, and get, get away unscathed. Uh, so, so, 
yeah, we would fight them with, with heat rounds close enough. We could shoot them out, but it took, like, like I said, the better part of, of five, five plus rounds to just make sure that it was, uh, you know, starting to, to burn and explode. Yes, I've heard some armor officers say to me, we shoot until that thing burns. You will not stop shooting until it burns. And these were the same type of tanks which NATO was facing in Europe. These were not Mickey Mouse, you know, pre-World War II tanks. These, these were modern tanks. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, a T-55 packs a, packs a heavy punch. I mean, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, if it was T-34s, then you could still say, okay, fine, you've, you've got a chance, you've got better mobility and you, your maneuverability and so on. But a T-55, T-54, T-55 is, is a different, different uh, kettle of fish. Uh, you, know, you can't really fight against that with an armored car. You know, the 90 gun that we got with the old Panards from France, uh, that's really not something that should be, like I said, on the same page. No, no, but this brings me to an interesting question. And of course, we, we're debating a bit because it never happened, I know. But the first Ray Carter, which you worked upon, at the 762 millimeter gun, which I believe you got from the Navy. It was part of a, it's actually a naval gun, which you put on. <clears throat> I spoke to uh, Admiral Suderlund, Jan Legacy, and I asked him if a reverse was possible. Can we take a G5 and put it onto a naval ship? And he said, like, all it will work or something like that. He said it will rust, and he had all sorts of reasons why it wouldn't work. But this was a naval gun, which was put on an armored vehicle. But it's smaller than the 90 millimeter. But how confident would you be? And I say again, this didn't happen, but should that gun has been, been used, should the way cut have been there, what would it have done? Would it have helped you quite a bit? I think it would have improved uh, my chances by about 500%. Um, <clears throat> there's not even a comparison. First of all, the penetration power of, of that gun is, is not comparable to that of a 90. The velocity is so much higher. It fires a, a, a FSDS round, which the 105 and 120 guns is typically your, your anti-tank uh, uh, type of ammunition. And with a high velocity, that slices through armored steel. Um, so yeah, that, that, that gun you wouldn't need to, to confirm with a couple of shots. I mean, one with one proper aim shot, you would be able to take out the tank with the with the 76 that's mounted on the rod on the on the Roika, which is that simply not the case with the with the 90. Uh, it's not uh, maybe not the same. They have now subsequently mounted the 105 on the Roika, which of course uh, is probably the ultimate in terms of, of of speed and mobility as well as firepower. Because there you definitely only need one proper shot. But the 76 uh, is totally capable of taking out the tank with, with one shot uh, if it's, if it's uh, done at the right place. Yeah, that's fantastic. I heard that 105 was built on the L7, which was a British, British yeah. well, and probably the best one in the West for a very, very long time. But now I need to ask you, should those enemy attacking tanks have shot off smoke? Would that have perhaps saved them or made it more difficult for you? And why didn't they do it? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, when you're in a, in a tactical situation, um, then, then your training and, and, and probably experience and uh, everything come together and you, you've got to use what you, what you can. You know, you've got to make sure there were incidents where I had to maneuver uh, some of our forces to prevent us from being enveloped. Uh, and sometimes you, you don't want to be visible. If they, uh, are you referring to the day when we used the missiles or just in general during the attacks with the tanks? In both actually, the day when okay. you came out of the missiles or in general? Okay, okay. that day I don't think- Using smoke, was it ever necessary yeah. for you to cover yourself? Uh, no, it wasn't necessary for us ever to, to cover ourselves. You know, we basically always fought ourselves. Out of it. But um, if they used smoke during that day while they were, um, you know, approaching us, I don't think it would have made much of a difference because we would have gotten hold of them at, at some stage. Um, and it was too far away. They, they were moving, you know. 
a smoke screen, you basically need in order to get away. You, you want to create a smoke screen uh, to give you protection in order to, to get away out of sight. Um, during one of the, the um, operations, one of the attacks that we were in, it was quite a heavy attack. Uh, we had tanks. Uh, I remember the day, once again, our uh, intelligence um, vehicle, you know, with the, that was monitoring the radios, reporting that <clears throat> there's, they were actually warning their own aircraft. They said, you know, they were relaying back to them, don't, don't bomb where the white smoke is because that is where our tanks are. And I was, I was looking at the situation here in front of me, I said, but yet here's the, here's the white smoke here in front of me, like uh, 150 meters to the left. <clears throat> All the time, our um, commander who was in charge that day. He wanted the tanks close by to the center of, of this attack. And I said, but I think, you know, the tanks is going to be on the side. And then this message came and I, and I, and I radioed back and I said, this smoke that they are talking about, I think it's the smoke here in front of me. I think the tanks is in front of me. No, the tanks must stay there. They, 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 are, they, I think you probably felt a bit safer with the tanks close by. Any case, that proved to be the tank, their tank uh, force. So we were right into the, into the alley. And I mean, we, 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 I identified the first one. I still remember driving up to my 190 because I was sitting in a command vehicle, um, and and giving him the fire, uh, you know, command, and then we, we 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 took it out. They had, you know, if they if they did use smoke, they would have obviously concealed themselves, and I mean, then you you wouldn't have been able to take them out. It would have been a relief if they wanted to use that in order to withdraw. It would have helped, yeah, certainly, uh, because the bush was so thick. Um, sometimes it was only a part of the tank. You know, we, we didn't see. When I say we we fought them at 50 meters, it doesn't mean that we saw a big tank standing there 50 meters. We saw a small portion of the tank through the bushes, and uh, you know you had to identify which part of it is and where is the the right part to to aim your shot at in order to effect maximum or get maximum effect. So um, that is how we fought them, you know, through the bushes, uh, you know, just a, a piece of, of, of the vehicle was, was uh, probably visible. Um, if they threw smoke, I think it would have actually just made them, you know, attracted more attention. So that's one of the reasons why they wouldn't do it uh, because the bush was actually more cover than, than smoke uh, would have given them. Yeah, that's a nice explanation. Thanks for that. I once asked the Rattle commander, Rattle 90 commander, I asked him if that thing can shoot backwards. He was very obnoxious. He says, we don't do that. They, they attack. We don't retreat. Well, perhaps I can reverse back. I don't know. You keep, uh, you know, the heavy armor to the front. But technically, can that thing shoot backwards while it's going this way? Uh, you, you mean a Rattle 90? Yes, the Rattle 90 or any tank for that matter, even the Willy Fonte. Uh, when you say backwards, you mean you're, you're reversing and you're firing at the same time? Or, or how do you mean, of course? I mean that the vehicle is moving forward, but the turret is turned to the back. So it's shooting over its own engine. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it can shoot. <clears throat> Look, there's a, there's a safety measure on, on every tank. Look, a tank has got a stabilized uh, uh, turret, a, a gun rather. So it can move and fire at the same time. It can stand at one, it can, it can stand static and do a 360 and the gun would uh, be kept stable in one position and it can fire at the same time. That is absolutely possible. Of course, you can't do that with a 90. I mean, that would be totally chaos because that thing you would traverse uh, manually with a with a hand wheel, uh, but the tank can can physically do that. It can shoot. It's it's just um, certain areas. Obviously, when you shoot over the engine bay, the the your your elevation has to be a bit higher. It can't drop lower than a certain degree. So it will will go low and it will go over the engine and then it can drop again. But you can fire in any of three sixty degrees. How important is the training of the gunner? 
in a roto? Um, well, training in any area is 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 crucial, uh, and I think that training um, in many a case uh, determines the outcome of 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 a battle. Um, yeah, that that that's that's just my short answer. Training is extremely important. So when we when we uh, got to the area because obviously you know our typical armor training area in Bloemfontein and Kloatla mainly comprises of open yeah, that's your typical you know according to armor doctrine open fields you know you will fight over a over um, hills maybe uh, when, when enemy approaches you will wait this side and then you will take a leap forward uh, and do observation and then uh, across again. <clears throat> So that obviously was thrown out of the window when we got uh, to the uh, bushy area um, of the operational area in southern Angola. Uh, and I think in when 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 this when this doctrine changes, it is even more important to have proper training. You have to adjust your whole tactical situation, your thinking and your your uh, approach towards the attack. Um, but having properly trained um, soldiers very well disciplined just makes it so much easier because you know that whatever you instruction you give will be executed properly and um, and them being familiar with the uh, with the situation through proper training um, just gives them the confidence to um, you know go into a fight uh, well prepared. <clears throat> so while I was a 3-2 battalion, every time we were, I was there for three years and every time we had a new intake at the end of the year, uh, you know, they cleared out and the next guys came in. And they came from from uh, after having been trained by School of Armour or the uh, or the unit 1 SSB or 2 SSB. I then had to give them a kind of a conversion training, you know, to acquaint themselves with the, with the circumstances and especially the terrain in which we were going to engage with the enemy, which was totally different from where they, where they came from. Um, and that prepared them, that prepared them very well. I never had any issues in terms of, of the fact that things were so different because they were already used to it. We, we, we did very intensive training with, with the guys before I even took them into, into Angola, you know, on the, on the, uh, well, we, we, we trained in Angola as well, but uh, before we went up further north. It's fascinating. You know, there's no replacement for training. Sorry. sorry, sorry, because I interrupted you. I just want to say there's no replacement for proper training in as far as That's very true. I mean, I spoke to Israeli armor officer and he said to me, thank goodness. Thank God, there's something like an elite in their forces. It, it's the same as a fighter pilot. They see that guy as, as you know, as something special. Let me tell you, if you if you sit behind, uh, you know, the site uh, in a tank, and you you've got a fire on the move. Now, I mean, it's, you're not driving on a on a piece of asphalt road where it's nice and straight and level. That thing goes up and down and it, it, it sways around. Um, it is it really a skill. And that skill, you know, a lot of people are, are marksmen. Some people can shoot better than others. It's just a given, you know, some people can run faster than others uh, and some, but, but that is number one, a skill. And number two, you've got to be trained. I mean, I can remember the first time when I was in a tank and you had to fire on the move. That 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 site, you know, you've got the cross here, and there's the there's the target. It it's it's all over the place. I mean, you think I, I thought to myself, how the hell do they expect me to ever hit that target? But the fact is, with training, with training, with training, and carry on doing it. Later on, you get so used to it. I mean, you you're sitting there, and at the right moment, you you press the trigger and you hit the target. And that only comes through through practice and 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 training. I saw once, I think it was at the Pretoria show, and in those days in the 80s, they had these massive army expositions, what's the word in English, show, but they were big. Yeah. 
and it was fantastic to see. And they had like a like a video game there with a point two two caliber rifle or something, which we were training with Ghana. Yeah, yeah. Can can you tell me something about this? I only saw it for ten minutes. I waited in the line to um, to have a, a go at it, and then certainly there was some incident, and I got called away. So if you can can tell me about that. Uh, uh... Look, I mean, they, they probably use that a lot more later on, but that, that's just a way, instead of, uh, you know, wasting um, uh, uh, 105 millimeter uh, round every time, in practice, it's like a simulator, you know, for, for pilots, um, just to, to, to get you used to. So instead of using the gun, they're using this uh, rifle that's mounted on the, on the tank uh, gun, and um, then create a situation where you've got to actually follow and fire on the move, you know, to simulate firing on the move. Uh, and then once you've, you've mastered that, you know, it's much easier when you get to the real situation because you, you've got a bit of a feeling already and you've got that background training, which obviously helps a lot. Okay, thanks. Were there any, ever any night engagements with armor during the border war? Uh, of course, no. Uh, not during this phase that I was there. Um, we never, we never, you know, the enemy did, and so did we. Basically, dug in every night. Well, they always did. Probably a bit better than than we did because they knew our artillery, the 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 you know the capabilities of our artillery forces, and uh, they would really dig in and then. Uh, use chainsaws to cut off tree trunks and put that over the, the trenches that they dug and then fill it up with um, with sand on top of the ground and then further layers of, of wood. So they did the very, very proper. And that's one of the reasons you remember I said in the beginning, you know, we, we, we had a massive barrage on, on them that night. And the next day they just, uh, you know, they just carried on moving. Uh, it was, it's because they, they dug in so well. Uh, we never, they dug in every night. And so we also kind of, um, you know, took it easy at night. We, we, we never had a fight. The last fight I had at Kaluek, <clears throat> that was also the last fight of this um, so-called, you can say, you know, the, the, the Angolan uh, uh, operations before the peace talks started for the Namibian independence. The last clash was at Kaluek. That was also where I was, I was wounded. Um, the, I, was, I, was, I was ordered to move uh, to Kaluek with my ZT3s <clears throat> from Eastern Angola, um, just opposite um, Kaluwe, uh, opposite um, Kutukanaval, where we, we had the last clashes. So, so I was a kind of a monitoring force there. And then this built up started in the western side, um, you know, towards the, the, the Southwest African Namibian border at the time. Mm -hmm. So they moved me because remember I was the only ZT3 operational at the time. So they decided to move me and I got instruction to report to Grootfontein. I would stay a week there. They would fix all my vehicles, my rattle command, everything. It's great. And the second day while I was there, I got a call from uh, Colonel Michu de Alport, which uh, the, who was the, the brigade commander there. He uh, said to me, tomorrow at 12 o'clock, report here. Yeah, you've got to be here. So that night we didn't sleep. We just prepared and hit the road. And uh, I mean, from Groot Fontaine to, to, uh, to Kalo Ek is, is quite a drive. Got there, he took my rattle command vehicle from me, which I was very unhappy about. In any case, um, I got, but I always had a spare rattle 90 that I, that I used, you know, for myself if we went into a fight or so. And, uh, and they made me the combat team commander because we were now going to approach this, this oncoming force. There was a huge tank regiment uh, as well consisting of apparently T-72 tanks. Uh, that's even worse than a T-55. I don't even want to think of it. In any case, uh, but I didn't have the radios in this Rattle 90. So I said to um, um, uh, Mike Miller, who was the battle group commander, 
I, I, I can't I can't be a combat team commander because I can't communicate with the infantry and the other elements there. I've, I've just got a normal radio here. My command vehicle was taken from me. So he made, uh, I think it was Kovas from Yellen of the MAC infantry, he made him the combat team commander. And that night we were approaching, Jimmy Stadler was the tank squadron commander to my left. We were now heading north on the other side of the of Kaluek, uh, towards this approaching force. And um, and and then it became you know very late and dark, and Mike said, uh, "Okay, fine. We have to stop. Do we want to occupy our positions right there, keep that, or do we want to move back before we uh, uh, pull a logger for the evening?" And I said, "No. I mean, I would like to just stay where we are, and then move from there." But the tank guys didn't want to. Uh, the, uh, Jimmy said no. He would. He 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 didn't want to because his tank, his his, his night vision is not is not on par with that of the uh, of the enemy. Uh, well, you know when you when you when you're in a position when you are waiting, you're actually in a better situation than the people who are attacking. You know if they don't know where you are, and that's why I didn't want to move. But in any case. That was the closest we were. But if they attacked us during that night, uh, we would have been ready for them. Um, but that never happened. They have moved during the night. I was in one case I can remember. I was uh, my whole combat team was was lying there that night. And about two o'clock that morning, I woke up. Well, actually, uh, well, no, I did wake up myself because I had to wake up the the radio guy. He was not uh, awake. And I heard this massive movement, you know, and you clearly that was one of their their regiments with tanks moving, and and um, all the the guys will know that it's very difficult to, to determine sound accurately at night. First of all, the exact distance is difficult, and then even the direction. You you're not a hundred percent sure it's coming from there or coming from there. It's coming towards you, moving, and and that was probably one of the most Tens, uh, uh, half an hours that I've had up there was because this whole combat team was lying here. We were in a lager, and uh, and I heard this 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 uh, massive movement coming, and it was like coming towards us. Now you believe? I mean, it's going to come right onto you. That that would be total chaos. So at some stage, I, I was going to have to wake up everybody and get them ready. Um, at least, you know, to to defend ourselves. And I remember waiting, waiting when I would, and I would say to myself, okay, I'll wait another another five minutes to try and determine, is it coming closer or is it not? And it was like heading our way and way. And I was about to, you know, make the call to wake up everybody and, and get ready, man their guns and, and, and prepare. And then I realized, no, it's it's moving past us, you know, it's, it's it, and then it started fading away. Uh, so they did move at night, um, especially in the beginning when we had air superiority until that incident that I mentioned. After that, that changed over. So we stopped moving during the day. We had to move during the night and they could move in the day. But um, we never had any, any clashes that night. Well, I'm very glad you survived that uh, wound. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was... Um, that that well that was during this this built up so the next morning that I was just referring to now that night when we we pulled we did pull back and then the next morning we moved forward because we knew they were there we were going to to clash you know uh, we were ready for that and uh, I I I tried to make sure you know every time we went over a uh, down a bit of a, uh, a slope. And, and up the next one, I would actually physically stand on my turret with my binoculars and, and do observation to make sure, because I knew they, they, we were going to hit them at some stage. They, they are there. And, uh, and the unit was clean or clear, and, and we would uh, make our next uh, move forward. And then still, I, I can uh, you know, never forget that, obviously. Well, that was when I was shot. Um, we, we, we moved down into this lower area and where there was a little bit thicker thicker brush and and trees and so on and the next moment we were just 
moving right up against uh, their infantry with tanks behind them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I it, it felt like just about every one of the infantry, and it, it, there were like hundreds of them in front of me. Um, and I just, you know, said to the guys, open fire, just, you know, maximum firepower, bring down maximum firepower on this, you know, to, to try and win this initial firefight. We shot out, I think, two tanks there. We did, uh, my guys shot out one. Well, I myself, because I was in front with him, I had now a 90, rattle 90. And the guy next to me was shot out by an RPG and the, the one on my side, left-hand side. On the right-hand side, the guys were, were killed, actually. Um, also shot uh, with an RPG. But I remember, you know, all these infantry, we would fire a, a shot of HE. I'm talking like literally 20, 30, 50 meters in front of us. And they would all go down, you know, because that was now like a bomb that fell there. And then I would uh, quickly go into the turret and reload uh, and then get out. And the gunner would take aim. I would give him a fire order. Um, and, and I would use the anti-aircraft machine gun at the top to, to, to shoot at them as well. And once the 90 has fired and they all fell down, I would go into the turret and reload again and come out. But in any case, at one stage, uh, I remember feeling this, this thing here in my neck and I thought, it felt like a bee that, that stung me. And I, I said, what the hell is here? And, and I remember my gunner saying, oh, fuck, Major, you shot. And, and then I, I, I looked and I saw it was blood. So it missed this artery. And it was quite a deep uh, wound here through my neck. And then my, my finger as well, that one was shot off here. But you know that was while, like I was standing here with the anti-aircraft. So a machine gun, you could see the marks on my rattle. All the wheels were flat, of course, as well. Um, as it went up and the one lower one bullet went through my finger here and the next one obviously through my neck. Um, but in any case, so they pulled back. Um, we did win the firefight. That, fortunately, I mean, if they knew what a small force we were, I had one, there was one tank squadron to my left and we were only rattle 90s. I had the ZT3 behind me, which we couldn't use because, you know, there was no arc of fire, you know, they were that quick, no, no open field. And then they, they fell back. They, they, they retreated um, to our, you know, I mean, like I say, they had T-72s, a brigade lying behind them. They would have totally wiped us out if they, if they were properly trained, if they had proper intelligence, if they knew what our strength was. But once again, our training, our accuracy, gained us the upper hand if we could win the firefight and that that initial initial firepower caused them to flip and just ran back and uh, and then of course we also pulled back as we then drove back i then had to because of that i didn't want to go back and then the medic said to me okay no that's fine then they'll just amputate my finger i said no no no, no. Oh, okay now you've convinced me so um i then drove back with my rattle and uh, we went over the color uh, water scheme the dam wall there and I stopped um, the rattle and they, they, they got me to the medic uh, I had bandages and, and so on temporary stuff but I mean by then the pain was absolutely excruciating here on my finger so they injected me with morphine and I was sitting in the back of the of the ambulance I can recall and uh, the, the, the uh, brigade commander uh, uh, Colonel Dalport at the time spoke to me and said, okay, fine, must they send the helicopters to come fix us? I said, no, it's not necessary. You know, take me to Kaluhek itself. Um, I'll see if I can drive with a, with a rattle, but all the tires were flat. And then they said, okay, fine, go with this Rimkos, this, this ambulance that you are in. That can take you there. Uh, and I said, okay, fine, that, that's okay. So after we left, you know, there was a bit of a small lager with lots of Buffalo standing and, and troops in the buffalo. Um, they were all like next to their vehicles with their kit. So we drove off um, and about three minutes after we left, I mean, we got to Kaluek, which is very close by, probably like 15 minutes later, I arrived there. And as I arrived there, uh, they told, Colonel Delport told me the place had been hit by the mix and a bomb. So this one bomb, stray, whether it was a stray one or whatever, fell exactly where that wrinkle of mine was standing. And 
the 10 people in the buffle next to me, that was our biggest loss of this whole operation. They were all killed um, at that, in that buffle. So um, yeah, I, I, I missed that one as well, fortunately. So I, I survived. I do remember that incident very well. It was, it was in the news. There were a lot of anger in South Africa about the loss. Absolutely. Um, I have to ask you, honest, just the last question. Omar, Omar is always protected by infantry, as far as I understand the concept. And I think you people had um, the free to battalion companies to protect you at that stage. But they started off almost as a irregular force, as a, you know, as light infantry. And now suddenly they had to become like mainline infantry, um, conventional war. So can you tell me a bit about then how the infantry conducted themselves protecting your armor? Look, um, you, you're quite right. You know, whenever armor operates in enclosed areas, which involves buildings or, you know, uh, bushy area the the infantry would lead the advance or the fight or whatever and uh, so obviously we being from from three to battalion we had our infantry and they kind of uh started working together and the guys really that's during that operation those operations that's where we we bonded tremendously i mean the guys started talking portuguese the, the troops and of course they they quickly realized that uh, it's it's much nicer to catch a ride on a rattle than having to walk by 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 foot or even in a buffalo for that for that matter and um, so they could pack their stuff on the rattle and they would sit there and um, when necessary they would get off do their thing and get back onto the rattle and you know, we would France with and of course you know we always had some extra coffee etc cetera, etc cetera. but the fact is um, they, that that's that there was a there was a an adjustment in in their use as well so when it was necessary they would get off and walk in front because we normally used unita to to guide us to places and normally when they started moving back we knew we were very close to the enemy uh and we would found ourselves without any infantry in the front which they were supposed to 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 provide so then our guys would, would go in the front and, 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 and move ahead. So that is, that is, that is what, what basically developed um, within 3 to Battalion. You know, our company, you know, the company that was with us would uh, get onto the rattles and get off when it was necessary. Uh, and and um, we, that just really worked very, very well together. I also had uh, Omar person once said to me, they didn't come to fight, they came to enter fight. Um, so may I ask you about the esprit de corps of armor guys? I mean, we've had the paratroopers here. Yes, we, we like them. No problem. But armor at the end of the day is what wins wars, isn't it? No, for sure. Look, I mean, uh, you, can, you can argue about um, the Air Force that brings down, you know, the the, the air power from, from the top, which is necessary. The artillery, which, you know, do uh, they do the bombardments, which is necessary. You need the anti-aircraft to protect you when you are being attacked by the Air Force. You need the engineers to provide you with mobility over certain obstacles like rivers and it. Um, and, and of course, you need the infantry. In the end of the day, <clears throat> The infantry can go and enter and and finish off stuff that you can't do from a tank. But the fact is, um, a tank, and for that reason, armor has got has got a certain uh, intimidation power. I mean, you have to be a very brave infantryman to to want to take on a tank. I know it is possible in in closed areas. But from a distance, uh, there's no there's no issue about it. And let me tell you, to see a regiment of tanks approaching, I, I can't think of anything more intimidating than that. And if they start to fire while they're moving, it's even worse. So so you've got not only tremendous firepower, you've got you know the sound that goes with it, um, which emotionally is also affecting 
you know, with with the with the firing that goes with it, has also got an effect on on the enemy. Um, and um, look, I I I always I always liked um, vehicles, big machines, and and that kind of things. But I I love the fact about Alma that that is exactly what you said. You know, we 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 will finish the thing. We will. We will stop what's coming. Um, yeah, you still need the infantry to wrap things up and to get the, you know, uh, finish off a few loose ends, guys running around or whatever the case might be. But um, really, the armor has that effect to 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 stop things, to end a war, to end uh, a, a conflict, and to occupy an area. And then, of course, we once again need the infantry to just come and and and, and finish off the the, the, the smaller things. But like I say, everyone has a role. I'm a I'm a, a armored soldier. I always wanted to be one, and I've enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm just happy to have been able to experience, you know, uh, whatever it it really entails to be a proper uh, armor armor soldier. Now I have to ask you, what happened to you afterwards? Um, you you didn't stay in the military. At one stage, you left. Yes, yeah, I, uh, you know, in, in just before the, um, the uh, democratic elections, they started because it was obviously, uh, it was obvious that the, 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 the demographics of the National Defense Force, SADF, would, would have to change. Uh, so they started to give opportunities to people who wanted to, to take early retirement. And, um, but there were certain criteria that you needed to, to meet. Um, one was age, which, which I didn't qualify for. And the second one was um, um, uh, health. So if you were like a G3 or something like that, which I, which I, I think I'm still a G1, K1, A1. Uh, so I didn't qualify for that. And then the third, the third um, possibility was if your post uh, could be terminated, you know, and and simply, um, uh, you know, cancelled or what, whatever. So my my colonel decided. Uh, I was at the time the senior uh, the staff officer productivity in the army. When I came back, I was while I was lying in. To, in one military hospital, I was somewhat transferred from three to battalion to army. But I never went even back because the peace talk started, and then three to battalion was uh, moved uh, to the new base in South Africa, away from Buffalo. And uh, uh, then, then, then I decided. You know, our 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 department was basically this. You know, can, uh, uh, how do you say? Um, they 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 decided that we could they could do without that department of productivity, and we both took early retirement. So I'm in a normal retirement. I didn't take a package afterwards. They started with packages, you know, and so on. I'm actually a normally retiree. Uh, I then went into into the financial industry, the financial services industry. I was a, a branch manager and a regional general manager with. Um, companies like Liberty Life and Momentum, and uh, also an investment uh, company that moved me from Victoria to Cape Town, where I've been living now for the last 19 years. And uh, when I, yeah, our company was taken over when I came to Cape Town, so I took a bit of a sabbatical and then I had to do something again. And I've always loved vehicles and I love people, you know, and now I'm in the, I went into the motor industry where I can, Basically, bring the two together. So to keep myself busy, I'm, I'm selling. I'm selling um, luxury vehicles at this stage. I'm, I'm yeah, in, in Cape Town. Yeah, BMW. We don't mind to say that. Okay. No, well, yeah, this is not the. <laughs> yeah, I've 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 driven BMWs all my life, and I was the chairman of the BMW club in Gauteng many years ago. Took many groups through the factory in Rosland. Um, so yeah, that is a bit of a passion of mine, uh, and, I, and I enjoy it very much. No, that's great. I remember driving a seven series Almut 
armored vehicle and then the 540 protector, which if I ever go back to South Africa, that's what I'm buying. It is just fantastic. There is something about the MW. Of course, I was in a police flying squad. I wasn't a good uh, driver. I was very, very bad, actually. But I fancied okay. myself. I fancied myself. I tried my best. But uh, honestly, it was so, so great to speak to you. Thank you for that. Well, Internet, we came to the end of a very fascinating interview. We are hoping to get uh, Major Notman back at some stage with some of his mates. Can't talk too much about it right now. We're still setting it up. But thank you very much, Honest. It was a pleasure. And I want to say to anybody listening here, you are not unimportant. If you have a story and you feel that your story should be heard, please just contact me and we'll take it from there. And until we meet again, God bless. Oh my God. Okay, hit one. There's something wrong with it. Hit one. Oh, I have to fuck it. Hold on, I'll get it away. Get it. Thank you.